the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness cannot, has not, and will not overcome it. Such a simple, obvious statement in the prologue to the Gospel of John, and yet so profound. No matter how much darkness you pile on, even the single flame of a match or a candle is enough to pierce that darkness. That's because light has substance, while darkness does not. In our day, quantum physics describes light as both a particle and a wave. A duality, an object that has both mass and interactive properties. That ordinary, everyday light that we encounter behaves in a spooky, extraordinary manner. Seeming to know the future and able to be entangled at a distance. Light, it seems, has a mind of its own. The possibilities of light as a metaphor for the divine are truly endless and have led to many wonderful interpretations throughout history. Today I'm going to share a few of those with you in the hopes that the light of God is revealed to you in new ways. In the 1990s, the Christian band DC Talk released a song that, to me, epitomizes the search for God's light in the world. They sing, I want to be in the light as you are in the light. I want to shine like the stars in the heavens. Oh, Lord, be my light and be my salvation, because all I want is to be in the light. All I want is to be in the light. Just as DC Talks say, I want to shine like the stars in the heavens, the poet Mary Oliver describes light at the center of every cell. That all living things are connected by life and light. She says we are to be dazzled by the light in everything. Many of her poems deal with going into nature and simply absorbing the way light moves through the world. Seeing creation as connected not just to the earth, but to the divine and to the human. Her ideas are reminiscent of the Celtic theologian John Scotus Eriugena who lived in the ninth century CE. Eriugena described the light of God as the essence of all things. Picture, if you will, a child's drawing of a sun with rays of light going off all directions from that circle. They all, though, converge if you follow them back to the center of that sun, if you imagine the lines continuing in. They converge at the center of the sun. To Eriugena, this was how the universe worked. God's light is spread throughout, but if you trace the lines back to their source, you find God. Now, he even goes further than this. He notes that the Greek noun for God is theos. Theology, the study of God. Theos, the Greek word for God. Now, this is a noun, but the verb that it's based on is theo. And theo means to run or flow. To run or flow. Motion, in other words. God is motion, the source that flows through all things, the river of life flowing through the universe, connecting everything together. God is that source which is constantly in motion. To me, this idea recalls modern science's investigations into the Big Bang, looking at how radiation and white, uh, white noise are spread through the constantly expanding universe. To trace it back to the source, the singularity, scientists look for those celestial objects which are furthest away. Their light just now reaching Earth is considerably older and thus closer to the beginning of those than those nearer stars. The old light points the way to the origin. And even though it has been traveling through space for between 13 and 14 billion years, it's finally managed to reach Earth without being blocked. I always feel a little bad about this, thinking about it. If we see it, it means it hit our eyes 
And that means that we've blocked it from tr continuing on its way, yet it's been traveling for 13 billion years, at least. Hmm. In the mid-1700s, the Reverend Jonathan Edwards described God's light as emanating throughout all that is. But that humans cannot perceive God's light unless God sends God's spirit to open their eyes. This, then, is the spiritually enlightened person. Anyone who has a sense of the gloriousness of God in their heart. Anyone. Edwards firmly believed that God's light not only shone on all people, but that anyone could be awakened to God's light through the Holy Spirit. That it wasn't just those who were learned or believed most strongly, but that God would and did open the eyes of people on the edges, on the margins, and that their experience of God's divine light was meant to be heard by all. That's where things are in our Acts story today. Peter and John are spreading light through healing, through reconciliation, and the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the temple, are trying to block the light. Now, it's easy for us to get caught up in good Christian, bad Jewish leaders and write this off as simply exemplifying the moral superiority of Christians. But I tell you, don't do this. Don't feed the anti-Judaism that has been so much a part of Christianity for so many years. Let's look at this story in a different light. The light of light. In healing the lame man, Peter and John have opened the eyes of over 5,000 men, plus more women and children uh, that Luke decides not to mention or count. Uh, we can shake our heads at him all we want, but at least 5,000 people and more than likely double or treble that amount. But they weren't traditional religious leaders, Peter and John. They were just ordinary people who happened to have an extraordinary connection to Jesus' ministry. So the Sanhedrin tried to condemn them, tried to force them either to conform to their teaching or to stop teaching what they were doing. They were trying to put the light into shadow. Today, it's not the Sanhedrin that's trying to fit the universal light of God into shadow containers. It is us. We who in this country are passing laws that limit God's expression in the lives of people. That instead of teaching love, light, and life, we are trying to legislate compliance with one interpretation. We need to speak up as Peter and John did and remind the world that God's light is not just found in one interpretive way, but in many ways. That God is the source of all light, not just the light of one interpretation. Indeed, that's an argument that is not new. It has been made for centuries. In 1848, for instance, the Reverend Horace Bushnell, a Congregationalist minister, argued that all forms of Christian faith contain partial truths that need to be seen as equally true. He's not trying to call for a new denomination somewhere in the middle, something that is pulling from all of these different areas. No, he's actually calling for a true universalism in 1848. Not only within Protestant denominations, but between Protestants and Catholics too. Truly radical for that era. Diana Butler Bass describes his position in a people's history of Christianity. Protestantism had suffered, Bushnell suggested, by being cut off from history. Catholicism had suffered, he believed, because it lacked a positive view of the future. By connecting the Christian future with the Christian past, Bushnell speculated that a new, broader, more organic, Catholic with a little c, Christianity, the church of the future, would emerge. Would emerge. Talking about emergent churches 150 years before that term became popular. In this process, Bushnell believed the light of truth would be revealed. We simply require it of all Christians to look for the truth, he wrote, and the truth only.
And if we require them to look beyond themselves and across their own boundaries, we see not that there is anything specifically frightful in this, if they look for nothing but the truth. Or if we prepare a previous conviction in their minds, that there is somewhat of truth in all Christian bodies, does anyone doubt that there is? We recognize the great principle that truth is a whole and is to be sought only as a whole. Anywhere, everywhere, and by all means. For Bushnell, then, this light of God could be seen as truths shared among Christian groups. Now, in stating this, Bushnell was actually unconsciously limiting, limiting the work of an earlier Catholic theologian, Juana Inez de la Cruz, a nun in Mexico City in the late 1600s. Juana Inez taught herself to read by the age of six and had to be restrained from her grandfather's library. I love this little detail. She had to be restrained from going to her grandfather's library in order that she could do the chores on the ranch ahead of time. She devoted herself to study and decided that it was more important to read widely and write poetry and carols and plays than to be married which is why she joined the convent. Juana Inez worried church authorities in her day, much like Peter and John worried the temple authorities in their day, and they sought to silence her prodigious output of writings, as well as her broad base of research. She argued that her studies were necessary to understand the eminence of sacred theology, known as the queen of the sciences in Catholic circles in her day. The queen of the sciences, theology. She asked, how can one who has not mastered the style of the ancillary branches of learning hope to understand the queen of them all? You see, for her, rhetoric, physics, music, mathematics, architecture, law, history, and astronomy all figured into Holy Scripture, and without knowledge in each of these fields, the Bible would be misunderstood. In sum, the question is how to understand the book which takes in all books, and the knowledge which embraces all types of knowledge, to the understanding of which they all contribute. Juana Inez, you see, believed that learning from the secular world led to the light of scripture being more visible. That prayer and study go together and they lead to the illumination of the mind. Unlike Bushnell, she didn't limit God's light to only explicitly Christian sources, but looked for connections between the secular truth and the Christian light. And you know, Juana Inez de la Cruz was not the only person in her era encouraging people to look for God's light beyond where it had been traditionally sought. As the pilgrims arrived in Plymouth Colony, they remembered the words of their spiritual leader, John Robinson, who unfortunately passed away before the journey to the New World. Edward Winslow, the governor of Plymouth, recalled Robinson's words to them. If God should reveal anything to us by any other instrument of his, to be as ready to receive it as ever we were to receive any truth by his ministry. For he was very confident the Lord had more truth and light yet to break forth out of his holy word. For though teachers of the faith were precious shining lights in their times, yet God had not revealed his whole will to them. And were they now living, they would be as ready and willing to embrace further light as that they had received. The light of God is revealed in new ways to new generations, yet all the rays point back to the source of all light, God's own self. Based on Robinson's words. In the mid-1800s, a hymn was written, and I happen to have that here. I don't have the music, so I'm going to read the lyrics to one of the verses to you, and uh, 
Give me a moment here. I didn't put this in the other script. <laughs> there we go. Okay, this was written by Congregationalist hymn writer George Rawson uh, between 1807 and 1889. The title, We Limit Not the Truth of God. We limit not the truth of God to our poor reach of mind. By notions of our day and sect, crude, partial, and confined. That universe, how much unknown, that ocean unexplored, for God hath yet more light and truth to break forth from the word. Eternal God, incarnate word, spirit of flame and dove, enlarge, expand all living souls to comprehend your love and help us all to seek your will with wiser powers conferred. O oh God, grant yet more light and truth to break forth from the word. I love the words of that hymn calling us to look for God's more light in the world. And in fact, the Presbyterian organization, More Light Presbyterians, get their name from this hymn, get their name from this sermon. They are a group that's advocating for LGBTQ rights in the church and especially in the ministry. And you can see where that would tie in to this idea of more light, hearing it from sources that have been discarded previously. John Philip Newell sums up the connection to the light in this way. We are invited to pay attention, to see the light that is at the heart of this moment and every moment, to know that we are full of light and can shine. And when the time comes to let it go, to let go of even our most cherished embodiments of light. But above all else, we are to love the light and keep giving ourselves to it. Whether you love the light as revealed in nature, like Mary Oliver, or you love the light as the essence of all things, like John Scotus Eriogena, or the light available to all whom God chooses, like Jonathan Edwards, or the light in the harmonies of different truths, like Horace Bushnell, or the light in all the works of the secular world, like Juana Inez de la Cruz, or the light that God is revealing to new generations like John Robinson, the light of God is available to you. The light of God is available to you. And it is the source of all life and all love in the world. May you be in the light as God is in the light. May your search for the light lead you to the way of Christ. May the light of the Holy Spirit open your eyes to see the light in places unexpected. Amen.